Welcome to the 700 Club. Destroying women's sports, compromising their safety and their privacy. Well, that could be the outcome of President Biden's push to redefine a federal law called Title IX. Fifty years ago, the law was established to prohibit sex-based discrimination in higher education. Now the administration wants to expand it to protect gender identity. Heather Sells has the story. The Education Department has made clear for months that it plans to change Title IX from a federal law created to protect girls' rights in school and sports to one that also protects gender identity. It's based wholly on someone's subjective gender identity. The Washington Post is reporting the proposed change, and legal analyst Sarah Parshall Perry says it's no surprise given the administration's priorities. The proposal is a dramatic redefinition of the groundbreaking civil rights law designed to level the playing field for women. It would expand Title IX's meaning of sex discrimination to include sexual orientation and gender identity. It's not only going to eliminate athletic opportunities for young girls and women, it's going to eliminate their sense of safety, security and privacy. Conservative legal scholars like Perry and a number of feminists agree that if men identifying as women can compete against women and share their locker rooms and bathrooms, it will erase women's sports along with their private spaces. They point to NCAA swimmer Leah Thomas, formerly Will Thomas, who became a national champion in his first season competing against women. Former Education Secretary Betsy DeVos is also concerned, calling the administration out of line. Congress has not acted, which is how our system of government requires such changes to be made, she argued recently. I want you to know that your president sees you. But President no, Biden no, is no. firmly committed to anyone who says they're changing their gender, and he wants their parents on board. The parents of transgender children... Affirming your child's identity is one of the most powerful things you can do to keep them safe and healthy. It's why Health and Human Services is also working to redefine sex, making it illegal for health care providers and parents, potentially, to refuse what's known as gender-affirming care. Parents as well who refuse to affirm those gender identities of their minor children could be deemed to be unsafe or abusive parents. Proposed rules in education and health need merely to go through a public comment period and then they can become legally binding, Gordon. Well, Heather, how likely is it that this Title IX change will take effect? Well, just to put it in perspective, Gordon, uh, the Biden administration announced on day one via an executive order that they were going to look at all regulations in all departments and look at them through the lens of the 2020 Bostock uh, decision and add gender identity protections in. So that's the backdrop to this. In terms of timing right now, we are expecting these proposed regulations to come out in the next month. Then there is a 30 to 60 day comment period. And then uh, the department has to look at all the comments. So potentially this fall, uh, we could be seeing these regulations put into place. But then we are, of course, also expecting legal challenges. And in fact, just yesterday, Fox News is reporting that 15 attorneys generals are saying they are going to fight back uh, in regards to these proposed regulations. Well, you mentioned Bostock. Is this another case where the Supreme Court is uh, creating legislation by, by changing what the word sex means in particular? In that one, it was all about uh, sex discrimination at the workplace. Are they just saying we're going to take that decision and now make it federal law for Title IX? Well, yes, indeed. The, the uh, Biden administration has a different view of Bostock. They are broadly interpreting it. The Trump administration was narrowly interpreting it and saying it just applied to employment. But the uh, Biden administration is saying, look, we need to review all regulations in light of Bostock. So potentially we are looking at very wide sweeping changes in education, in health care. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's in some ways we've known this was coming, but in some ways I think the general public is just not aware of, of what is coming down the pike. All right, well, let's talk about what's coming down the pike. What's the risk to parents 
who don't affirm children who say, well, I believe I'm of another sex. What, what, what's going to happen to them? Right. Well, and that is exactly what the attorneys, the 15 attorneys generals were pointing out uh, in their letter to the Department of Education. They were saying we are very concerned about parents' rights. We're concerned that parents aren't going to have a say when it comes to things like uh, gender issues. And we're already seeing this play out in a number of schools where there is uh, counseling that's taking place around gender issues that parents are being kept out of the loop. So that's a big concern. I will add that there is also a growing bipartisan parents movement in this country. Parents are more uh, aware of what is going on in education than they have ever been. And there are these public comment periods that will be coming up where people can respond and where the Biden administration will be gauging the political winds, if you will. Uh, and there's also school board elections coming up. So there is a lot going forward. Uh, there's going to be a lot of public debate around this issue, Gordon. All right, well, let's talk about one of the main areas for public debate, which is HHS might um, issue a similar rule, now mandating health care coverage and, I assume, health care treatment for transgender services. What impact will that have on uh, employers, hospitals, and especially parents? Well, this is really stunning here, uh, what the potential ramifications could be. Uh, the Catholic News Service is reporting that the Catholic Benefits Association, which oversees ca or is an association for Catholic employers, has received some documents that indicate that there are going to be mandates in terms of surgical abortion, in terms of uh, transgender hormones, transgender surgery, that they are going to require uh, all health care providers to provide these types of services. And this is just going to be a no-go for Catholic hospitals. Uh, They're not going to be able to abide by this. They have got one-sixth of all the hospital beds in the country. So the potential ramifications of some of these uh, HHS regulations that we think are going to be coming out in the next month are really significant and could affect, of course, more than Catholic hospitals, could affect uh, faith-based employers of all kinds. Um, and there, it's not looking, Gordon, like there's going to be religious exemptions. So potentially some really uh, significant changes coming forward. All right. Well, Heather, thanks for the insights. Uh, this is definitely we're getting into some troubled waters here. Uh, just just look at that statistic. One, one six of all hospital beds are, are done by Catholic charities. They, uh, hospitals were essentially created by Christians. These these this is our uh, heritage. You can look at the medical history of mission work. You look at the medical history of Europe and America. Uh, these were all founded initially on, on Christian precepts. Let's heal the sick. Let's help the poor. Let's, let's do good to other people. Now that we're becoming increasingly secularized, and when you have an administration that seems to want to drive wedge issues, you're going to see those religious rights trampled. Uh, I hope some common sense comes into Congress and to the administration saying, why are you trying to divide us even more? If a Catholic hospital wants to provide hospital services, they have a perfect right to. If a Presbyterian hospital wants to provide hospital services, they have a perfect right to, and you can't come in and mandate things that are against their religious con conscience. Uh, let us establish freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, freedom of religion as a bulwark of American society and stop trying to impose your view uh, on people who are just trying to do good. In other news, a political crisis is looming in Israel after the governing coalition lost a key member. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon, a member of Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's coalition quit today, claiming Israel is losing its Jewish identity under the current government. Edith Tillman's departure raises the possibility of new elections less than a year after the government took office. While Bennett still remains in power, instead of a 61-59 majority, he now oversees a Knesset that stands at 60-60. That will make it difficult for the government to function or pass legislation. Opposition leader and former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu welcomed Silman's decision. Well, turning now to the crisis in Europe, Ukraine's president called on the United Nations to boot Russia off the UN Security Council for atrocities against civilians. This as the world prepares more sanctions against Russia and the United States sends more arms to Ukraine. Charlene Aaron has the story. 
Speaking to the UN Security Council Tuesday, President Zelensky called on the body to hold Russia accountable for war crimes as he laid out the atrocities committed by Russian forces in the town of Bucha. They were killed in their apartments, houses, blowing up grenades. The civilians were crushed by tanks while sitting in the, their cars. He also urged reform at the UN by kicking Russia out of the Security Council and removing its veto power. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to close the UN? Do you think that the time of international law is gone? If your answer is no, then you need to act immediately. While the Russians are calling the images out of Bucha fake, testimonies of survivors are coming out every day. The victims include innocent men, women and children, some apparently tied up, tortured and shot at close range. This man says men younger than 50 were lined up and shot on the spot. He survived because he's 53. What we've seen in, uh, in Bucha is not the random act of a rogue unit. It's a deliberate campaign uh, to kill, to torture, uh, to rape, uh, to commit atrocities. President Biden and European leaders are set to announce more sanctions against Russian government officials and their family members. The European Union reportedly proposing sanctions directly against Vladimir Putin's two daughters. The U.S. is also sending an additional $100 million in security assistance to Ukraine helping its military secure more Javelin anti-armor systems. Meanwhile, Russian forces continue to deploy to the south and east. Human rights groups say the situation in the besieged city of Mariupol is desperate, and the atrocities there are likely much worse. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Well, in the face of these horrifying crimes, millions of Ukrainians are fleeing the country. Just over the border in Poland, one mother shared her story of escaping the war and finding help from CBN's Operation Blessing. It was very scary in our village. Soldiers were already in our village, and that meant Russians were there too. They started shooting. That's when I got really scared. I have two children, so I decided to take them and leave for their sake. The shooting was so loud. As Jana and her children made the long journey to the Polish border, they saw staggering signs of violence within their country. We passed Russian checkpoints, and in the field, you could see unexploded projectiles. We were driving, and my son said, Mom, look, something is sticking out of the ground. When Jana's family reached the Polish border, they saw the Operation Blessing signs and team members ready to greet them. Everyone was so polite. First they gave the kids and me food. Then they gave us something hot to drink. They gave us winter clothes and took us to a tent to warm up. Thanks to the generosity of Operation Blessing partners, we're providing critical supplies, food, and shelter to refugees. Thank you very much. From the bottom of my heart, with a pure heart, I'm so grateful. There are a lot of people like me, with kids who come here without anything, and we don't know where we are going. We only know we have to escape the war. I don't know how to express it, so I just want to say thank you. With so much destruction and destroyed lives, the need is great. Gordon? No, thank you goes all the way from that refugee to your home. If you're part of this Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, it's going to you. People are giving thanks to you for what you're doing to help them. We can't do it on our own, uh, but when we pull together, when tens of thousands of people say, yes, let's make a difference here, uh, we can't go and fight the battle. Uh, some of us can't go to Ukraine or Poland, but we can all pull together to say, yes, let's make a difference. And we're doing it in your name when you give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. It's real easy to do. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can also write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just write Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check. You can text OB Crisis to 71777 
or you can go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. You're supporting all of the centers. If I can get that map up, you can see all the different centers where Orphan's Promise has been operating. Operation Blessing has been in Ukraine for 30 years, Orphan's Promise for 20 years. These are established centers where we're doing work, some of them right in the middle of the war zone, but we're doing things in your name. We're, we're giving people food, water, uh, clothing, warm clothing, housing, uh, shelter, uh, and we're doing it on your behalf when you join with us. So if you want to be a part of it, call us, 1-800-700-7000. I've got some good news for you. Next Wednesday, April 13th, my father will be back on the 700 Club sitting in this chair, and he'll answer your voicemails live on the air. To leave a question, all you have to do is call this number, 1-800-677-7884. I'll say it again because I messed it up. 1-800-677-7884. Now, the phone lines are open today only between right now and 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So call with your voicemail question, 1-800-677-7884. Well, inflation, supply shortages, and the war in Europe all point to a looming global catastrophe. Food experts warn a historic famine is on the horizon with 285 million people at risk of starvation. Dale Hurd brings us the details. It's mealtime in the nation of Yemen, but Ghalib al-Najjar isn't eating so that his children have enough food. He says he and his family live like ants or fish. We eat what we can find. Experts warn that in the months ahead, food is going to be harder to find in many more nations. A perfect storm of several problems is decimating the world food supply. It's being called the biggest food crisis since World War II. An estimated 285 million people face starvation. The head of the World Food Program, former South Carolina Governor David Beasley, says the world food supply already faced a catastrophe before the war in Ukraine. We're so short of funds already, and now with Ukraine, we've, uh, we've got 50% rations for people, for example, in Yemen, Niger, 50% rations, Chad, 50% rations, and 50% don't have anything, those who are in extreme need. In the U.S., Americans have seen food costs rise almost 10 percent over last year, the steepest increase in 40 years. And experts predict it will lead to an increase in malnutrition among America's poor. In the developing world, however, it's become a matter of life and death. Russia and Ukraine together produce almost one-third of the world's wheat. But Ukrainian farmers have been sidelined by the war and Russia has banned exports. They, they've got to be planting again and harvesting again. If, if they don't, then you're going to have a global supply problem. And the war in Ukraine is only the latest of many problems to hit the world food supply. Food prices were already high from soaring inflation and fuel costs. Fertilizer prices are now 40 percent higher than a month ago before the invasion of Ukraine, which, along with high fuel prices, makes it too expensive for some farmers to plant crops this year. We've never seen these type of increases in fertilizer. You're talking three, four hundred percent increases in a 14 month period. Add to that a drought that damaged this spring's U.S. winter wheat harvest. In China, severe flooding late last year wrecked the wheat harvest and has the communist government trying to buy up as much of the world's supply as possible. And now a growing list of nations have banned agricultural exports to other nations. Reverend Eugene Cho of Bread for the World says the U.S. needs to do more to fight global hunger, asking Congress to approve $3.8 billion in supplemental emergency funding. But let's just talk about Afghanistan. 98% of the population do not have enough food to eat. 98%, 1 million children under the age of five could die from malnutrition by the end of this year. Even Africa's wealthiest nation faces a food crisis. According to Nigerian agri-investor Imal Silva, 
who told us a majority of Nigerians face malnutrition. The, those that are, are, are most affected are the majority um, in the lower and middle class, you know, in the society. You know, those that are living below a particular level of income would feel the pinch, and that's quite a large majority. And Beasley warns the world's food crisis could spiral into a political crisis. You got catastrophe coming to catastrophe. So don't be surprised if you don't see destabilization in several nations over the next six to nine months. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, there's a new term in nonprofits, and it's called food insecurity, and that's another term for hunger. But we're getting into a very old fashioned word, starvation, where you just don't have any food, you have no ability to get food. Where is that going to hit? It's primarily going to hit those nations you just heard about in Africa, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, Nigeria. Uh, food insecurity is going to get to a level where they literally do not have enough food to feed their own population. Why? Well, it's the perfect storm. You have Ukraine, which produces, it's one of the largest producers of red wheat in the world. You take that source of supply off the table. Then you add into it um, uh, transportation issues coming out of China. The whole port of Shanghai is shut down right now. You have a drought in our own country in the Midwest, which is affecting the wheat harvest right here at home. Then you have skyrocketing fertilizer prices because fuel costs are going through the roof. And, and that just, you know, can you afford to even plant your crop and properly fertilize it? So all of these things are coming together. Let us pray to God. That's what we need right now to say we, we need you. Please avert this catastrophe. We can see it coming. How do we get uh, food production going in these nations in Africa? How can we provide irrigation? That's the number one thing they need. How can we break the log jam so fertilizer prices come down? Uh, that's something Congress definitely can do right here in the United States to get our own farmers planting again. All of these things can happen, but we have to have the foresight to bring it to bear, and then we need the unity to bring it to bear. What a great cause. Let's come together so that no one has to starve in the coming year. We've seen NBC anchor Craig Melvin on the Today Show the network's coverage of the Olympic Games, the Super Bowl, a few presidential inaugurations, and pretty much every major event that's crossed the news wires over the past few years. And along the way, Craig has made a few headlines himself. Craig Melvin is the co-host of The Today Show, who will also be front and center as the only network anchor to cover the entire duration of the Olympic Games. As a devoted husband, father, and man of faith, Craig understands the importance of turning to God for help. He garnered a lot of attention when he asked Bishop T.D. Jakes to pray for our nation on live TV. Um, 30 seconds for, for folks who weren't able to, to get to church uh, yesterday. I've never actually done this on the air. Uh, can you lead us in, in prayer for, for 30 seconds? Yes, I can. If our, our Father and our God, we bow our heads to you. Well, Craig Melvin joins us now via Skype. And Craig, we welcome you to the show. It's great to have you on today. Terry, it's good to be with you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, we just saw a snippet of your viral moment with Bishop T.D. Jakes. Walk us through what happened. Well, you know, that was, that was early on in the pandemic when uh, we just didn't know. Uh, a whole lot about the virus, and we didn't know a whole lot about where all of it was headed, and people were scared, myself included. And um, you know, I, I'm 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 one of those guys who, when I don't know something, um, I turn to God. And uh, in that moment, I felt like a lot of folks didn't just didn't know a lot, and um, I felt like we could we could use a moment. Um, with God, so it was. Um, it, it was not something that I, I had obviously talked to a producer or or news management about ahead of time. I was just moved by the Spirit, and uh, fortunately for me, um, uh, Pastor Jake's does a lot of television. So when I gave him thirty seconds for a prayer, <laughs> he, he was able he was able to keep it uh, to pretty close to thirty seconds. 
Well, he, that was a wise thing to do because he's such a strong presence and he commands the presence of people as they come before yeah. the Lord. It was great. But what are some other ways that your faith influences how you cover a news event? Because as you said, you, you, you're not always in a position where you can do that. No, you know, I, I, I discovered several years ago um, that there were a number of stories involving faith that just weren't or being told. Um, we don't really cover uh, faith uh, a great deal. Over the last few years, we've done that. In fact, and I'm, I'm working on one now. Um, I love stories of redemption and forgiveness. Um, and we're working on a story uh, now about um, a fellow named Kwame Kilpatrick, who was once the, the mayor of Detroit, um, who uh, who fell on some hard times and was indicted and, and spent a number of years in, in federal prison. And while he was in prison, uh, he found the Lord. And, and now the, um, the, the one-time huckster is, uh, is, a, is a man of great faith, and, and he preaches the gospel. And I, I, I love stories like that. They speak to me, and I think they speak to a lot of folks. So uh, we're making more of a concerted effort to get stories like that. Yeah. Well, you lost an older brother to cancer. You lost a niece to pediatric cancer. These are the kinds of things that, that sometimes cause people's faith to falter. But your faith sustained you during those tragedies. How? They did. They did. Um, well, first of all, my older brother, who lost to colon cancer at, uh, at, at 43. He was diagnosed at 39, but we lost him at 43. Um, he was a Baptist minister. Um, so uh, we grew up. With, with faith. Um, and I, I, I am not one of these people um, that, that only turns uh, to God uh, when things are, things are at their worst. I also um, like to thank him every morning. Um, I, I pray a prayer of gratitude to start the day. But, you know, for me, during, Terry, during those dark moments, and they were quite dark, um, you find that sometimes there's really no one else to talk to, no one else to, to, to pour your heart and soul out to, no one else to ask for guidance. And so uh, when my niece was, was terribly ill many years ago, uh, she was diagnosed with a rare form of Ewing sarcoma at two, and, and, and she, was, she was dead six months later. She was three when she died. Um, so that, and then my, my brother's illness, and it was um, several years. I mean, he, he suffered for a while. Uh, with colon cancer, um, I I had no choice but to but to lean on my faith, lean not onto thine own understanding, right? Exactly. <laughs> Gotta get out, climb to the rock that's higher than you are, right? Recently, you published a book on fatherhood. Tell us some of the things that you learned from pops. Yeah, you know, it's going back to stories of redemption. I'm I'm always drawn to those types of stories and. Um, there's no story of redemption that's uh, hit closer to home for me than, than my father's story. My dad and I write about it in the book. Um, my father was a, uh, a functional alcoholic for decades um, in South Carolina, and he was not physically absent. He was there physically. He wasn't there emotionally, certainly not spiritually. But um, And this is how I grew up. And uh, thank God for my mother, uh, who had to play the role of mother, father, um, uh, lots of other roles growing up. And, but my dad was in the house. He worked at the post office. He was a mail clerk uh, when he retired several years ago. And as I, as I got older and I, I started to achieve, you know, a, a, a modicum of worldly success, I, I, I found myself growing angry er at my dad the older I got. I was resentful, um, and it, it wasn't good. And so I, I had to, for my own sake, I had to get to a, to a point where I forgave him. And I did. And that, that happened several years ago. And, um, and he got into a, a, a drunk driving accident some years ago, and we decided to use that as an opportunity to try and stage an intervention. And it worked. And we, um, we put him in an, an inpatient rehab uh, program down in Georgia. And he was in there for 
10, 12 weeks, and he came out a different man altogether. Uh, and when he went in there, Terry, when he went in, he was 68, seems 68 years old, late in life. Uh, he, had been, he had been drinking for 50 years, um, and he hasn't had a sip of alcohol since. Uh, the man has a, a willpower and a determination uh, that I've, I've, I've never seen up close. But it's also a testament, Terry, and I write about this in the book, and it was one of the reasons I wrote the book. It's never too late. It's never too late to turn your life around. It's, it's never too late to decide that, that you want uh, to live a different life. It's never too late to, 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 to get that monkey off your back, to shake that addiction. Um, but you have, to, you have to believe that with your whole heart. Um, and, and we were prayerful as well. I mean, it's a, it's a testament, to, it's to, it's a testament. To, to so many things. Yeah. It really, really is. Well, Craig, thanks for being with us. And most of all, thanks for being, you know, a, a person who's bringing faith into the marketplace with everything that you do, because God uses that. Thanks for being with us today. Great to talk with you. Terry, thanks so much for talking to you. I grew up with the 700 Club, so this is quite the honor. Awesome. Well, it's our honor to have you. Thanks. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. GOP lawmakers are calling on the mayor and police chief of Washington, D.C., along with U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, to investigate reports of possible late term abortions at a clinic in the city. Oklahoma Republican Senator James Lankford sent the demand letter, joined by 17 GOP senators and five Republican members of the House. The case centers on the discovery of the remains of five aborted babies reportedly taken from the Washington Surgery Clinic. Pro-life group that took possession of the remains say, says they show signs of partial birth abortion, which is illegal in D.C. The lawmakers want an autopsy to determine if that is indeed the case. Well, a little good news for America's drivers. The price of gas has fallen about uh, an average of about five cents over the last week. According to the tracking site Gas Buddy, the decline is due in part to a drop in oil prices. They dropped to under $100 a barrel in the days after President Biden announced a release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve starting in May. Still, prices remain historically high. The national average for a gallon of gas now stands at $4.16. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Durga is a young girl from India who was born with club feet. As she grew older, they became even more painful and twisted. Well, today, thanks to you, Durga's feet are straight and her future is bright. Just see for yourself. Durga got bullied and teased in school because she had club feet. They called me lame, like it was my name. It really hurt my feelings. I lost my confidence and stopped going to school. She needed surgery, but her parents couldn't afford it. My feet twisted more and more out of shape. It hurt so much. I thought I would have to live like this forever. Then her family heard about Operation Blessing. They reached out to us, and Operation Blessing soon arranged and paid for her surgery. I am very happy. Now my feet are straight like everyone else's and I can walk normally. Nobody makes fun of me anymore. Durga's confidence is back. Now I can play with my sister without any pain and problems and I have found hope in my life. I'm starting school again soon and I want to become a teacher. Thank you all for helping me. I have a new life. God bless you abundantly. God bless you. It goes all the way from India to you, near home, where you are, because you're doing something marvelous. You're providing young people, children, a, a hope, a future. You're giving that young girl a big smile on her face. And it's all because you cared enough to give. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing to do just that, to be a blessing to people around the world. Uh, we, we have offices uh, spread out strategically, 12 different regional centers, 
Uh, I've lost count of the number of sub offices from the from those centers, but it's all made possible because people like you care enough to give. Well, just a reminder that next Wednesday, April 13th, we'll be featuring your voicemails on this program. My father will be here to answer your questions live on air. To leave a question, all you have to do is call the number on your screen, 1-800-677-7884. Call today, only from now until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And once again, the number, 1-800-677-7884. Be sure to watch the 700 Club next Wednesday, April 13th. My father will be right here answering your questions. Well, the power of God in our lives, it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. So what will increase the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and what will hinder it? Benny Hinn answers these questions and more in his new book, The Mysteries of the Anointing. Author, pastor, and evangelist Benny Hinn has preached the gospel to more than a billion people around the world. He is known for his miracle crusades and his daily television program, This Is Your Day, which is broadcast to over 200 countries. Yet after 40 years of powerful ministry, he went through one of the most painful seasons of his life. What he learned about God's divine power during that time, he shares in his latest book, Mysteries of the Anointing. Oh, please welcome back to the 700 Club, my dear friend, Benny Hinn. Benny, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, dear God. And you are my dear friend. And thank you for this wonderful privilege. All right. Well, you went through a very difficult time in three, for three years in your personal life. You described some of it in, in, in your new book, Mysteries of the Anointing, if I can get that lined up right. There you go. Uh, so tell us, what happened in those three years? Well, it was 2010, 11, and 12, Gord, when I went through that difficult time. And, and I, of course, continued ministering. And what was amazing to me is my personal life was struggling but the anointing in the meetings did not weaken or diminish. And I would go home wondering why God would use me in those meetings that I had during those three years, and yet my own life spiritually was struggling. And then I came to the conclusion that the anointing on my office had nothing to do with my life. And so I began a search through the scriptures. And I want to know everything God said about the anointing. And to my amazement, I discovered that every one of us as believers has an anointing within that we received at salvation that has nothing to do with the anointing that comes upon us when God uses us. And to my shock, you know, I knew some of that, but I just never really looked into it like that. But to my shock, I discovered it's actually possible for someone to be used of God and have a demon like Saul. It's possible for someone to be anointed for ministry and be involved in witchcraft like Balaam. And so I began looking at what does the Bible really say about the anointing? And to my Again, to my amazement, I found three main rivers of what I call of the anointing. One, for your personal walk, which is in your life. Second, one that comes upon you, not in you, but upon you when God uses you. And then it lifts when God is done using you. And three, an anointing that is only used rarely, really, upon nations rather than people. And the anointing of 1 John 2, 27 was really an, an amazing eye-opening experience for me when I began studying it, and I saw similar scriptures that talk about the anointing within. And so in 1 John 2, 27, dear God, it talks about the anointing that abides, the anointing that abides in you rather than the anointing that comes and goes on you, you know. So as I began looking at that verse, and then it just kind of expanded to more and more, is John was writing to the church at that time because there was a heresy going around 
where people were believing Jesus was not the Son of God and did not come in the flesh. And John writes and says, the anointing that abides in you will tell you the truth. You will know the truth by it. You don't, you don't need anyone to teach you, but that anointing which is in you teaches you all things. Well, he didn't mean that the, that the anointing within us will teach us everything about the Bible. He was simply saying that the anointing in your heart will reveal to you who Jesus is in your life, that he is the Son of God. He did come in the flesh. And as you look at the scriptures, you know, it talks a lot about the anointing within you, like God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that resides in us. Well, that power that resides in us, very few people talk about. So when people talk about the anointing, they're, they're thinking ministry. They're thinking someone anointed to preach, anointed to pray for the sick, and so on. But the most important anointing is the one in people's lives, which has to be nourished. And, and the way to know it's there, like, you know, example, I've been ministering the gospel now, goodness, 48 something years, and I've had the, the anointing come upon me many, 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 many times in different meetings and, and, and crusades. And when I am done, it lifts. And it affected my, my physical body. It affected my emotions. But I never thought about what else does that anointing upon me that came upon me and lifted when I was on ministering affected. But the one in you, the one in you, how do you know it's there? You know, it's easy to tell when it's on you because you, you can feel it on you. You can sense it on you. But how do you know when it, how, how do you know the anointing in you is there? Well, first, you can't feel that one. So three things. Number one, that anointing came in when people were saved. When you and I were born again, three things happened to us. Number one, we became hungry for the Lord. Hunger is the sign of life in the spirit and in the natural. Number two, everything in us knew, I'm saved. I belong to Jesus. That's called faith. Well, what, what brought that hunger? What brings that faith that tells me in my heart, I'm born again? I don't have to read a book to know that. I don't have to watch a TV program to be convinced. Not, uh, no angel comes and says, you're saved now. I just know it by the Spirit. It's a witness by the anointing. And thirdly, I begin to love Jesus having not seen him. Think about this. This is amazing. 2,000 years ago, thousands saw the Lord and did not love him. Today. We love him having not seen him. So what brings that hunger? What causes it to grow? What causes faith to grow? What causes love to grow in us? The anointing. Which one? Within. Right, and I've so- I've got to ask this question because uh, we've just got three minutes left. So I want to really focus in. This is a question that reading your book, let's focus in on chapter 13. Where you talk okay. about one of the keys to the anointing is ministering to the Lord. Uh, yeah. That's been something that's always been a puzzle. What does it mean to minister to the Lord? And that is what keeps the anointing within alive. I'm not talking about the one upon you, the one in you. Ministering to the Lord means like Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3, minister to the Lord, not for the Lord. You, you cannot minister for the Lord till you minister to the Lord. And he ministered to him and changed the whole nation of Israel when he was young. Think about in Acts 13, they were ministering to the Lord and Saul of Tarsus was called as he was ministering to the Lord. So the Lord did not call him while he was on the road to Damascus. He called him while he was ministering to him. And ministering to the Lord is worship. When we worship him, when we adore him, when we spend time with him, when literally we surrender completely to him, we minister to him. And ministering to the Lord uh, is what happened with me, dear 
uh, Gord, back in the 70s, I spent hours and hours just worshiping the Lord. And even during the Crusades from 2 p.m. on, people thought maybe I was praying. No, I was worshiping. The whole time I was worshiping, not realizing the power that is in ministering to the Lord. And ministering to the Lord, literally, uh, it actually moves him to give himself to us. It says so in Ephesians. And that is what nourishes that hunger, nourishes that faith, nourishes that love. But the anointing upon someone has nothing to do with that. God trusts that individual as they walk with him, with his power that God uses through them to touch people. All right. But well, if, Benny, Benny, we're running out of time. I got to promote the book because there's obviously whole chapters here that you haven't even touched. It's Benny's book, yeah. it's called Mystery of the Anointing. It's available wherever books are, are sold. My friend, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, here's a word from Zechariah. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.